Nii et see on ainus ettekanne, mis tuleb inglise keeles. So I switch to English now. And welcome our friend Pavel Krenik, who teaches media studies in University of Warsaw. And his topic today is LEM in other media. Yes, thank you. I feel pretty weird. Or I'm going to apologize for not being to speak Estonian. You know, it is a kind of a science fiction experience where you kind of when people are talking about them and you pick up just the surnames. And you know, so far all the surnames were great. Uh, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, uh, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the festival for inviting me here, and I I hope I will earn the take to make it worthwhile. Um, so, Lem Media, I was trying to be witty here, yeah, I'm not sure I, I'm quite successful in, in that, but um, what I would like to talk about is uh, not Lem's literature, because I'm sure a lot of people have said very intelligent things about it, but rather the sort of afterlives of this fiction in across various media, and perhaps we could uh, begin with, you know, I'm trying to be witty here again, uh, this is obviously not Lem, this is the rapper Drake, but you might have seen that, uh, that meme online from Facebook. That uh, during his lifetime, Lem was rather ambiguous and ambivalent about media in general. I mean, he did collaborate on a number of early uh, film adaptations of his works, and he wrote scripts for several, uh, but in general, he was, especially towards the end of his life, when the kind of a current media culture, um, digital culture, started to develop. He he was rather skeptical of everything that was happening. There are those; they are as anecdotal as they are true. Stories of them dismissing the internet, the early internet, as the place where you can only watch pornography. Um, that was, of course, the kind of a, the 1990s, but even then this wasn't quite true. But, so he did not really have uh, much of an opinion of yeah, visual, audiovisual media, not to mention contemporary digital media. Uh, he, of course, had a very high uh, opinion of literature. So I'm not sure if he would have been very happy, but um, also during his lifetime, of course, he was aware of that, but also after his death, uh, that he has been very much present in audiovisual media. So just to have a sense of what we are talking about, uh, if you look at the numbers, uh, and so the big number is 43, uh, which uh, there is an American writer, uh, Steve Wright, who thinks that number 43 is the organizing number of the universe that once you start counting, you find 43 everywhere. Uh, it's one of one of the things. But 43 is the number of just films, short films, and television series. So of course there are other, uh, especially more contemporarily, there are other media, there have been theatrical stage adaptations, there is audio plays. So these are not even included, and several video games, one of them, a major one in the works. Uh, so 43 does not include those. This is just kind of an old-fashioned filmmaker or the visual stuff. And so 43, and among those, these categories, of course, don't end up. End up uh, these are different perspectives. There are 11 full-length feature films, uh, 20 shorts, among which there is a number, there, is no, there are nine animations. Um, his fiction was the subject of... Um, nine television films, so that's a separate category, or television plays. Uh, there are three miniseries, there are either five or six episode miniseries that aired during his lifetime um, on television. Um, then has he also very international in terms of the countries in which his work was adapted and produced. So uh, Poland, of course, and these are just the selections. Uh, Poland, of course, is going to be leading the way with 17 productions, uh, but Czechoslovakia produced five, uh, Germany, and that includes Old East and West, and then post-unification Germany, nine, Soviet Union, six, uh, but also one production, there is an Estonian production, 
of course, of Pilot Perks, uh, the Inquest, uh, which is usually in most places listed as Poland and Soviet Union. It was not. Mm -hmm. I mean, Soviet Union loved that, but it was really Polish, Estonian, and some Ukrainian uh, collaboration. Uh, there, is a, there is a production in Japan, there is one in Argentina, and there is a bunch of other countries. But, you know, he, he was, during his lifetime and, and afterwards, you know, a very um, good source for all kinds uh, of media adaptations. Among those, quite predictably, uh, Solaris is almost like its own industry, uh, semi-industry. Um, there are, um, so on the basis of Solaris, this is the cover of the first Polish edition uh, of Solaris back in 1961. Uh, very strangely published, you can read it at the bottom, by the Ministry of National Defense which is kind of a weird place to run a science fiction novel, but maybe back then in the early 60s this was you know, very appropriate. Uh, so Solaris was um, adapted into four films. Everyone knows about Tarkovsky, and everyone knows about Soderbergh, where you could see uh, the naked bottom of George Clooney, among other things. But there is, what very few people know, there is an earlier, before Tarkovsky adaptation by a Soviet adaptation uh, by Boris Nuremberg that came out in 1968. It's incredibly obscure. It was technically a television film. It's only available on a really small run DVD where it's actually paired with another movie, Russian movie, which is not even science fiction, but the connecting theme is one of the actors who's in that version of Solaris is in that other movie. And it's kind of a uh, Russian DVD that came out maybe 15 years ago, so it's very obscure. Uh, and it is very interesting, runs two and a half hours, and it's mostly talking heads. Uh, but, but it precedes Tarkovsky by four years. There's also a much more contemporary Japanese version of Solaris that came out in 2007, which runs at five and a half hours. So here is a challenge for you. Um, Solaris was the subject of four operas, uh, five theatrical plays, a stage plays, two radio plays, one multimedia project coming out of Macedonia, and, and really dozens and dozens of music concept albums. Uh, the most recent of which uh, by Martin, uh, by Kevin Martin came out last year and it's titled a Return to Solaris. It's kind of a fictional soundtrack in, in, in response to the soundtrack of Tarkovsky's. Um, Solaris. And it's kind of understandable if you're familiar with Sol Solaris, and I assume you are, that among his works, um, uh, this kind of lends itself to, to media adaptations. But I would not like to talk about the numbers and kind of, of course, go into, um, uh, go into specific descriptions of all of them because that would really take us a long, um, a long time, five and a half hours like the Japanese. But I'd like to talk a little bit more about three that I find really interesting, the chances that you may not have seen, so I would really encourage you to do that. But before that, I'd like to return to my, uh, uh, to my Drake meme and uh, Lamb, um, to talk a little bit about uh, the problems with adapting uh, Lamb to especially film or television or short film, is that, of course, what drives many audiovisual uh, uh, texts, as we say in cultural studies, so uh, films, television series, and so on, is, is the conflict, and in that conflict it's the individuals that play the crucial part, and in the classical Hollywood, which has subsequently really colonized global cinema, in the, in the classical Hollywood tradition, it's the motivations of characters that really drive the story. It's the motivations of uh, conflicts between characters that drive the story. And in that, there is a problem with adapting Lem, because Lem was not really that great with people. And I guess you could say that both him as a person and his con you know, contacts with other people, but he was not really great with writing characters. Uh, of course, there are characters in all his books, uh, or most of his books, uh, but these characters are really, more often than not, they are kind of faces or mouthpieces for ideas. 
uh, they are very often excuses for various uh, political, technological, sociological, and so on positions. Right? They are not really very good, deep characters that you know stand out, that are kind of a believable, that really create a kind of a human uh, human uh, connection with the viewer. Right? Which I think in many cases is a big problem when adapting. Um, in that, in fact, uh, Lamb stands in sort of direct opposition to another writer uh, with whom he is sometimes kind of a juxtaposed and another writer with whom he actually clashed. Um, I wonder if anyone, oh, sorry, if anyone recognizes the writer. Of course, on the left we have Lamb, and on the right, does anyone recognize him? Yeah, this is Philip K. Dick, an American writer with whom, uh, you know, probably if you look at some science fiction critics, if you asked who really is the most important, the most visionary writer of science fiction in the late 50s, but really 1960s and the early 1970s, most people would say, of course, Lem, who had been translated into a number of languages uh, relatively early. But a lot of other people would also say Philip K. Dick. Now, there is a per the story of personal conflict between uh, Dick and Lem. Um, um, Lem was, if not the first, but the one of the very first non-anglophone writers who was admitted to the Science Fiction Writers of America, the organization that sort of um, uh, combined and kind of a gathered uh, science fiction writers, and there were mostly Americans, uh, a bunch of Brits, a couple of French people, but he was, uh, he was probably either the first or one of the first who, in recognition of his fiction that was really, of course, truly visionary ahead of his time, he was, he was admitted as a member of Science Fiction Writers of America. Uh, uh, now, uh, and a lot of his work was translated into English. Uh, relatively early, although, for instance, Solaris, which you may or may not know, uh, for a very long time the translation, the English translation of Solaris was actually not from Polish, it was from French. Uh, then hated it. Uh, the, the direct translation from Polish into English appeared only in 2011, so very, very late, and it's only available as an audiobook or as an ebook because of the copyright, so there is still in print the only uh, English version of Solaris is still, you know, through French, which, yeah, you can expect does not really give justice to the original uh, text. Uh, but anyway, so, so Lamb was known in, 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 um, in, in the United States, and Philip K. Dick, who, apart from the great prose, uh, was also known for consuming large quantities of mind-altering substances, uh, claimed very publicly that Lamb does not exist. But Lamb did not exist, but it's not possible that a writer who has that kind of depth of thinking and conceptual density could be one person. Uh, they claimed publicly on numerous occasions that you know, Lamb is really a KGB, you know, the Russian secret police construct, and a bunch of people writing together. Um, and of course, you know, Dick was entertaining as a, as a persona, uh, but, um, uh, but the science fiction writers uh, of America did not take these things very seriously, to which, you know, Lamb kind of expected respect, this was kind of a typical Lamb in many ways, uh, after SFWA uh, uh, had failed to react, I mean, he demanded that Dick be expelled, Dick was, of course, the member of the organization, too. Um, so Lem had demanded a number of times that Dick be expelled, and, of course, he, he wasn't. So at that point, I think in 1975, uh, Lem himself resigned his membership in protest, but the organi organization did not uh, react to Dick's uh, accusations that Lem did not exist. Uh, so that's, of course, you know, that makes for a great anecdote, but, uh, but the connection in the context of what I was, of what I was talking about is that uh, Len, of course, is great with ideas, but his characters uh, are mostly faces of their fronts for ideas, for concepts. They are not really uh, fully developed, empathetical, kind of a relatable uh, characters. 
And Dick's fiction, you could say, is exact opposite. That, I mean, I'm not saying that there is no, there are no concepts in um, in, um, in Dick's fiction. I mean, there are a lot, but of course, probably of a different nature. But Dick was able to write really the characters that we can really empathize with. I mean, most of the time, really broken characters, uh, but very interesting nevertheless. So there is a kind of a interesting uh, connection verb, but also, to come back to my original point, a challenge that, you know, how do you adapt, and most adaptations, media adaptations, ultimately revolve around characters, how do you adapt the fiction of a writer who was just not really good with human beings, especially on paper and not only. So the three, uh, the three adaptations that I would like to talk briefly about, and perhaps kind of interest you, uh, I think I'm doing very interesting things in that respect. So they take lens fiction, but they kind of try to move towards more relatable and interesting characters. The first of them is the is a short one. It's it's Golem. You can see it on Vimeo for free. I came out I think nine years ago. It's a short film based on a um, on a on a short story titled Golem 14. Uh, um, I think, and it goes on for about 10 minutes, and the story itself is a kind of amusing sort of reflections of, um, of an artificial intelligence, a kind of a military simulation computer that has achieved uh, consciousness. And what is interesting about it is that while the visuals, pretty much the entire short film, you see something kind of a kind of a thing that you can see here on the, the very beginning. So really abstract, beautiful kind of a swirling colors and kind of a morphing into, into shapes. And and portions of the story are read out sort of in the background as a kind of a narrative and this is supposedly that military AI sort of musing, talking or thinking about itself. What is very interesting, so this seems very minimalistic and where are the characters you could ask, uh, but what is very interesting that, that, that military AI, that God in 14, actually has a female voice, which especially in the context of the 1960s and the 1970s fiction is not something you would expect. Uh, uh, women were sometimes in science fiction, not so much in Lamb, there are very few women in Lamb's fiction. Uh, but, you know, in science fiction general at that time, were mostly presented as sexy robots, but, uh, which was not, of course, very, uh, very nice, but these were the times, I guess. But, uh, so that decision to, to use the female voice uh, of a voice actor, a woman voice actor, or a voice actress, uh, to kind of uh, present those musings of a, yeah, kind of a, Military eye of deep consciousness is, I think, a very interesting um, decision that sort of goes towards perhaps our reimagining of you know what these machinic subjectivities could be like. So this is kind of a warm up. Now the second um, film that I'd like to mention is relatively recent. Um, it's the adaptation of his master's voice that came out in 2018, so three years ago. It uh, is directed by Georgi Palfi, an intensely interesting Hungarian uh, director who really, I don't think he had done any science fiction, even kind of a speculative uh, film before, but you know, if you're interested in Hungarian cinema, you know, Palfi is definitely the way to go. He's, he's absolutely fascinating. Now, and I don't know how, how, how familiar you are with his master's voice, at least very vaguely what it's about. Uh, the entire novel, the original novel, is about an attempt to decode the message from the stars, uh, alien message that was received. But, um, and it's a kind of first-person narrative of a principal engineer, mathematician, Peter Hogarth. Um, who is struggling to decode that. And again, for them, of course, this was an opportunity to uh, get into the discussions um, of cosmology, astronomy, communications theory, uh, the evolution of, you know, the, not just of biological life, but of the universe. So kind of the usual them, you know, really, really heavy philosophical ruminations. 
Um, so as such, his master's voice of a novel seems to be kind of unadaptable. You know, how do you do that? And what Palfi did, he completely flipped the perspective uh, and Peter Hogger from uh, the original novel does appear uh, in, in the film, but uh, the basic story is in, in the movie is about the Hungarian family or a grown up Hungarian man whose father, uh, a genius mathematician, this is Peter Hogger, had disappeared still during the communist times. He escaped to America, leaving his wife and two sons back in Hungary. And now, uh, in more or less contemporary times, one of his sons uh, uh, tries to find his father. And he travels to the United States. There is a kind of a little opportunity for a kind of a sort of a, uh, a road movie element there, because uh, he is the father. Um, is very hard to find. His son finally finds him. These are not spoilers, really. You know, this is so I'm not really spoiling the movie. I really like to encourage you to, to, to see it if you have a chance. So he eventually finds him, and you know, this is where the movie connects with the novel, because it turns out that his father had disappeared not only because he abandoned his family and went to the United States, where he actually, in the meantime, uh, has started a new family. Uh, uh, but his father was uh, recruited by the U.S. government to work on precisely the same secret project that we know from the novel. So decoding the message from the stars. And in the movie, like in the novel, you know, there is really no decoding. There is really no answer what that message uh, was or who actually even, uh, even sent it. But I think what is very interesting about that movie, and we do see the father, the, the, the main character from the, um, uh, from the book, uh, probably in the, the last third uh, uh, of the movie. But uh, Palfi has turned this narrative into the, uh, the narrative precisely of the kind of abandoned son. There is a kind of a pre and post transformation Hungarian, kind of a more general Central European motif there. And so it, I think it is a very interesting movie. It also, as usual with Palfi, gorgeous visually. It opens with this rather unexplained shot of a human being hovering in this huge space, uh, which later on kind of uh, changes or morphs into a um, kind of a, something that you can interpret like a kind of a visualization of atoms coalescing together. Uh, but then it cuts to yeah, uh, 2012, 2015, uh, whatever the year it is in the movie. Um, so it is really a uh, beautiful visual in terms of uh, cinematography and montage. Uh, but it tries to give this kind of a, in some ways, soulless novel by Lamb. It tries to give it this human dimension and by sort of flipping the perspective from the scientist Hogger to his uh, two sons and the mother appears in the movie three too. So that's the second recommendation. The third one is probably the most unexpected. Um, the Congress, directed by Ari Folman, a famous Israeli director. If you watch movies, you may have seen his Waltz with Bashir, um, an animation feature that I think it got a Khan Award. Uh, uh, Waltz with Bashir is about the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, conflict. Uh, the Congress um, has a pretty big cast, so something, you know, you know, kind of very mainstream cast. So there's Robin Wright, who at that point was, I think, riding or riding high. Of course, she had been uh, very active in a number of productions, but this is already the beginning of a house of cards, and everyone starts recognizing uh, Robin Wright. Uh, Harvey Keitel, uh, slightly underestimated, but a really brilliant actor, Paul Giamatti. Um, it's fairly big budget. Uh, um, and in many ways it is a kind of a mainstream movie, although it's not a sort of super Hollywood production, it's really a European co-production between five countries, although the US also chipped in some money um, too. Now, as you, can, uh, as you can gather from the title, uh, the Congress is loosely, again, loosely based 
around the Futurological Congress, you know, one, again, of man's more famous uh, texts. And the basic premise um, is still there, which is that there is a Congress, like here, uh, and except the Congress is attacked with uh, mind-altering substances, and the main character starts hallucinating, and the rest of the story, the original story, is really hallucination within hallucination within hallucination, and so on. And again, part of the story is kind of an attempt to get at that truth. And so that, that part of hallucination within hallucination, and etc., etc., is, is still there. But again, it's Robin Wright who uh, is put at the center of, of the movie. And again, I'm trying not to spoil who is this uh, middle-aged actress who became very, very famous uh, very early, which is kind of almost autobiographical uh, in some ways. And she actually is named within that movie, Robin Wright. Um, became very famous, but now, uh, not only because she's uh, coming on 40, which of course in Hollywood is the age when women drop off the visibility and casting, you know, except for several really famous names. Uh, but also because there are transformations in Hollywood and in general in the media industry where they are moving away from real actors but towards first simulated, uh, I guess, digital avatars that are much cheaper to employ in the movies. And eventually where the original story is also kind of the actually making the viewers of the audiences of all consumers actually uh, consume specially doctored chemical substances that make them feel like they are actors or actresses in fictional scripts. Um, so in some ways, and this is something that is of course completely absent from the original Lamb story, is that the movie is you know, a very poignant, a very sharp uh, comment and critique of a contemporary, not just kind of a film culture, but kind of a media culture. And not just kind of a cult of celebrity, but also the influence that technology has had on filmmaking in the first place, but in general kind of audiovisual uh, production in the last 20, 20 years. Uh, but what is really interesting, and I think it's, it's very hard to convey, especially if I, you know, I had one slide with three, um, uh, with three uh, screenshots, but the entire middle of a film, which is one of the levels of hallucinations, is fully animated, so it really goes from live uh, to animated back to live, and uh, Robin Wright's character is the one that sort of connects all of these. Uh, the movie is heartbreaking. I mean, it is, if you're not going to cry at least once, uh, when watching that movie, that probably means there is something wrong with you. No, I'm not really. But, but it, it, is, it is really a poignant, sad, heartbreaking movie, which is, again, the quality you would never find in Lamb. And it's, and, and it's that not because it critiques civilization, which, of course, Lamb uh, was very good at, but because we feel the connection to what happens to human beings in that sort of civilization, in that in the, movie, the media landscape. Uh, it's intellectually, of course, it's packed with, uh, with allusions, not just to Futurological Congress, but to other works by Lem, but also other works by science fiction, and even sort of more of a other text, movies, television series from, um, from, from the current, it came out in 2013, from the current sort of media landscape, especially the animated part. But again, why it takes this basic premise, and the original text, of course, was very dystopian, was very pessimistic, and then there is that too in, in, in this one, but it definitely injects uh, Lamb's text with this you know, very poignant, very soft, and kind of very emotional human factor. That, I think in any kind of adaptation is something that you really aim for, perhaps what many creators aim for, is that you not only give a certain degree of justice to the original, 
but also that you add something from you that your viewers can relate to, that it's actually more than the original. And definitely the Congress, but also uh, the other two that I, that I talked about definitely do. So again, I don't get a percentage from the tickets of the DVD sales, but do watch it if you have an opportunity. Thank you. Do the delegates have any questions to you? I do have one. Uh, so, science fiction is uh, a tricky phrase. Oh. There's two parts, science and fiction. Mostly authors are either in fiction or in science. Now, uh, most of us uh, have read at least some novels of land. Uh, you told us about movies, so when you put them on that scale, so are the movies rather more fiction or more science? That's a good question. Um, it, it, it depends what you look at. I mean, these These three that I, that, I, that I briefly talked about, I mean, they definitely have a scientific uh, component. So there is this kind of a biochemistry or kind of a bioscience behind these drugs that do these things in the Congress, for instance. And there is some sort of pretty loose physics in his master's voice, for instance. But, but these are definitely, if you want to break it into these two halves, they are more fiction. If you look at the early uh, Lem adaptations, you could, I mean, especially the number of shorts that came out in the 1960s and the 1970s that he very often wrote uh, scripts for. One of them was probably one of the more famous, uh, was directed by Vida. Vida actually had wanted to film Solaris too, but he didn't secure financing uh, back in the 1970s. So if you look at these early shorts, I guess there was a Maybe it wasn't science per se, but definitely there was this, there was a lot of this kind of philosophical, kind of a logical, most of it was talking faces. Um, so, you know, they are put in some circumstances, but, you know, within that division, if I understand the question, you know, they were more, if not scientifically focused, then at least kind of a philosophically focused, but kind of a, but of course the object of that philosophical uh, consideration was very often science or certain rules of the universe. Um, so in that respect, uh, yeah, kind of these three are more fiction. Although you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure if these are all mutually exclusive. And, and there are, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right that there are writers, uh, and Lem was one of them, that for whom the science or things kind of the thinking was far more important, which is. I think one of the reasons why he was so bad with people, or characters. Uh, and there are other writers who treat, science fiction writers who treat science as a kind of just an excuse, right? And it's really the conflict, the feelings, the, the transformations uh, that are more important. So, um, so probably in that, Lem would be part of that sort of tradition that within science fiction sometimes has been called hard science fiction, so more focused on, on, on that. And movies, yeah, uh, it's a good question. So at least these two, uh, the last two movies, they definitely want to sort of go away from that sort of very rational, very meticulous thinking. Because ultimately on the screen, it would have been boring to a certain extent, right? I mean, if you want that, you read the books. But it's a big question about science and fiction, obviously. Any other questions? So would you say that because he was bad with people, he didn't like the adaptations which necessarily had to dramatize or psychologize, in the sense that, for example, Tarkovsky's film is quite intensely psychological? Um, that's a good question. I I probably should know it, but I don't know how he felt about Tarkovsky's film. Which he hated it. Did he hate it? Yeah. Okay, so that's, well, it's that's... that's one of the speakers Okay, well, see, that. that's me feeling alien yeah. in a That's true, but he tried to sort of reason with Tarkovsky, but, but 
didn't see a point. Well, Tarkovsky was not an easy person to reason with either. <laughs> uh, ingenious director, of course. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, he, as I said, I mean, in the... But that might have been mostly either Polish or some of the early German adaptations uh, that he collaborated. But they were mostly shorts. Some of them animated, some of them live action. So he, he collaborated with those directors. And, and there, I think, he kind of more or less accepted the results. And in several cases, he, he wasn't just kind of the originator of the text, but he, he co-wrote or even wrote in several cases the scripts. So I assume that if he okayed that. Uh, but later on, those later adaptations, you know, I'm pretty sure he would have been appalled by the five and a half hour Japanese adaptation of Solaris, yeah. but that's me trying to get into this. Um, so, I'm not sure I'm answering the question. But, uh, but as a general theoretical question, would you say that science fiction as such has to spend extra energy to achieve psychological depth? <laughs> or would you consider it rather a cliche that's sort of around about science fiction? That there are not too many characters? No, I, I, I mean, if, if you're talking about them, you know, we've already talked about it, but if you think about science fiction in general, I don't think this opposition actually is true. And it, you know, it's true that for decades, science fiction, you know, was associated with a kind of a cerebral, mental, cognitive quality, but yeah, the characters are bad, the conflict's not unbelievable, and so on and so on. But that, of course, has been changing in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, some of the greatest science fiction novels, but also films that are great with some kind of science, although we remember it's always fiction, are also absolutely great psychologically. And have, I mean, if you think about the contemporary really interesting writers, I don't know, China Nieville, for instance, in, 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 in the UK, uh, or some of the uh, women writers in the US. I mean, they have great psychologists and they also have very interesting world building and very interesting science. So I don't think it's in the last several decades when you could say science fiction has finally grown up. Polish studio, but it's delayed. At this point, it's, it's delayed, I think, by two years compared to the original. So it's very hard to say when it comes out. But uh, much as I love video games, I wouldn't expect them to be them to be great in video. I mean, this may be a very interesting video game, but uh, but I don't think uh, again because of the requirements and kind of dynamics of the medium. But it's going to be the game that people who love LAM will accept that. But you know, I I will be happy if I'm if I'm wrong there. So. But thank you, Pavel, once again. Thank you.